Welcome. So glad that you were here. Whether you're here in person or online, I know we have, we have sort of people out and about. There's a, there's a bundle of people who are up in Lost Canyon at their family camp right now. So just been praying for them that they have a good restful time. And, uh, but also just praying for you all this morning. We're uh, just, uh, when I'm, my, my, my prayer has been this morning for us as we encounter the Lord here today through worship, through the word, through prayer is, uh, I guess there's, there's an honesty that I, that I hope for. In fact, the passage we're going to be looking at is t- he talks about a good and honest heart. And that's, that's my hope, that's, my, that's been my prayer for us today, is that we would be honest once again about the state, the condition of our heart, uh, what, we, what we know and believe uh, about Jesus Christ and, and in so doing know him and, and lean further into him. And so just from the get-go, I want you to know that's been my prayer for us is that we would just lean further into the person of Jesus Christ uh, and allow him to tell us who we are and where we are in this time and space uh, with respect to God and, and so forth. So that's been my prayer for us as we, as we come to the Word of God. We're starting a new series this, uh, this week, a six-week series. It's going to take us into October uh, on parables, specifically six parables from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to just kind of stay in Luke because for whatever reason, we don't go there a, a ton or haven't over in the past. So I thought, all right, let's, uh, we did a hospitality series early on, on in the spring and, and hung out in Luke. And so I thought it might be fun for some consistency to uh, stay in Luke. So that's what we're going to be doing. There's uh, there's six weeks here in this parable series, and to sort of get us used to parables and to illustrate that, I want to assume that uh, anybody in the room or everybody in the room or people watching online know exactly what a parable is. So to illustrate that, I want to tell you a story, a story that you are probably all very familiar with because it's one that perhaps you heard at a very early age. It's a story about a rabbit and a tortoise, or you might know it as the hare and the tortoise. And the story goes that the hare and the tortoise were hanging out together, and it's not how Aesop wrote it, but that's how I'm going to say it. And the hare started making fun of the tortoise, about how slow the tortoise is. And the tortoise was like, I don't know, rabbit, we'll call it a rabbit because no one says hare anymore. Uh, I don't know, rabbit, like I, I get places quicker than you think I do. And the rabbit laughs at the tortoise. He says, you know what? If you think you're so fast, uh, I challenge you to a race. And the tortoise says, okay, let's race. And so a fox comes into the scene, apparently, and he's kind of hanging out and listening to all this. And he sets up the starting line and the the finish line. And they line up, the tortoise and the rabbit, they line up together. And the fox says, go. And the rabbit takes off. He, He just cruises down the pathway out of sight in a blink of an eye. Meanwhile, the tortoise is plodding along. Well, the rabbit realizes and sees that he's so far ahead of the tortoise, he hasn't reached the finish line yet, that he decides, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really just kind of rub it in that I am so fast, and I'm just going to chill here at the side of the path and kind of wait for him so that I can mock him some more. And so he does. The rabbit lays down by the side of the path. He hasn't reached the finish line yet, and he falls asleep. Meanwhile, the tortoise is plodding along, and he gets this the spot where the rabbit is and the rabbit's sleeping and the tortoise is like, whatever. And he keeps going to the finish line. The tortoise wins the race. What's the moral of that story? Yeah, slow and steady wins the race. Or I think the stated moral that Aesop has is, is something to the effect of speed doesn't always win the race. There's a moral to this fun little fable. Fable is a story involving animals. Well, a parable is similar. A parable doesn't involve animals. Actually, a parable involves very common everyday occurrences that tell uh, a story with a meaning behind it. That's what a parable is. It's a simple story meant to communicate or teach an important principle, particularly about life in the kingdom of God. When Jesus tells these parables, there's a deeper meaning to these simple, very common, everyday circumstance stories that he's telling. They're very relatable. 
and they're very easy to remember. Relatable to the, the very first hearers, for some of us, we kind of have to explain and understand what was going on in society and culture in those days, but for the most part, it even transfers over to, to today. They're that simple and commonplace, but there's a deeper meaning uh, that Jesus is, is wanting his hearers to understand. So today, we're going to look at our first parable in Luke chapter 8. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, they are in the seat back in front of you. I'm also going to have it up on the screen. This is commonly known as the parable of the soils, but I just labeled it dirt. Uh, we're all dirt. That's, that's what we're supposed to take away from this. Uh, but but that's, that's what this is. This is a parable of the soils, and we're to relate actually to these soils. So Jesus, I could have called it soiled, but that probably wouldn't have been as appropriate. Uh, I just thought of that one. I should have changed it. Uh, all right, so verses, let's look at verses 4 through 8, parable of the soils. And, and this is in three sections, by the way. We're going to look at verses 4 through 8, which is the actual parable that Jesus tells. And then there's an explanation of why parables. Why does Jesus speak in parables? And then the end is a, is a longer section on the meaning of this particular parable. So that's how we're going to take it in three parts like that. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable. So again, that sets the scene. Have that in your mind's eye. There's tons of people. There's so many people crowding around Jesus. And so he decides to speak in a parable. He says, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and it was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil, and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's a relatively simple story. Just kind of let the the image of this sink in a little bit. A sower or a farmer is walking along. You would usually have a bag over their shoulder and sowing seed. Just sowing seed in the field. And inevitably, because it's not a perfect science, as he was flinging the seed, it would kind of go everywhere on all these different types of soils. Because you wanted to make sure that it was covered well and getting all of the seed out of the bag. This is a common occurrence. People would have heard Jesus tell this parable and go, ah, I've seen this. In fact, many of you have seen this. Many of you have done this. Although you didn't have a bag and spreading, and spreading seed, you, it's, it's uh, September. And in a couple of weeks, some of you are going to reseed your lawns. If you're new to Phoenix or Arizona, that's what we do here. We put in winter lawns because our summer lawns die. And so we put in winter lawns. And what happens is you, we go out and we spread the seed and put manure over it and all that stuff. And pretty soon, the seed comes up. We've seen this. Maybe. Maybe the seed comes up. That's Yeah, thanks for that caveat. Some of it might fall on the sidewalk, right, as we're spreading that seed. In fact, that's what happens here with this farmer. Some of the seed lands on the packed dirt, on the path where people walk, and the dirt is so hard that the the seed can't germinate. It won't even go into the soil at all. And so the birds come along, and they eat the seed, which is also a problem. Or it falls on the rock, he says. This, there's this soil, it's a real, real shallow level of soil over this bedrock. You can't see it uh, just by looking at the ground. It looks like dirt, but just below the dirt, there's this rock. And what happens is that the, the dirt is often warmer on top of the rock. And so the seed is like, oh yeah, warm earth, I'm going to grow up. And then it can't grow roots down into the rock. And the sun scorches it because it can't get enough water because that soil is so shallow. And it dies. Or some of the the seed gets spread into an area where you can't see it yet, but there's weeds that are going to grow there. That's a problem, isn't it? And so this this seed, it grows up, but then the thorns and the weeds, they come and they they take over as they always do. I don't know what, what is it about weeds. They grow faster than every other useful plant. But then there's the good soil. The fertile soil and the seed lands in the good soil and the fertile soil and it eventually grows up and it produces a bountiful harvest, a generous crop. 
As Jesus tells this, people are listening. And he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He says that a lot, actually, throughout the, the, the Gospels. Even in Luke here, at one point he, he wants to tell his disciples something and he says, let this sink down into your ears. What does that mean? Essentially, it's a, it's a way to say, seek to understand this. Jesus is saying, understand what I'm hearing. There's a deeper message here, and I'm inviting you to understand. Hear it, and then let it sink down into your ears, into your mind, and into your heart. Essentially what he's saying, because parables have a distinct purpose. Look at verses 9 through 10. And when the disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. That's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? It almost sounds like God is sort of like, or Jesus like, wants truth to be concealed from people. That's not what he's doing, that's not what he's saying. Although there is this reality that parables sort of reveal secrets of the kingdom to those who have ears to hear it, to those who are ready, to those who desire to know more, not just from the person telling the parable, but with the person who is telling the parable, in this case, Jesus Christ. So they reveal secrets of the kingdom, but parables also conceal secrets of the kingdom for those who refuse to hear. Jesus is quoting Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is called by God, and he has this big vision in Isaiah chapter 6. You can go there and read it. And one of the things that's said about the people of Israel, as Jesus calls his messenger, his prophet Isaiah, he's standing before God, and he uses this phrase, that, they're, that they're gonna, they're gonna, they have eyes, but they're not going to see. They have ears, but they won't hear. God, with his prophet Isaiah, is already kind of setting the scene like, you need to know what you're going into with these people, my people, Israel. They're stubborn. They won't listen. They won't change. They're so deeply set in their ways and in their sin that they, they're not going to want to listen to what you have to say. So Jesus is quoting that, that passage. And so rather than it being a thing where God is like, you know, I don't want anybody to know about me or I don't want anybody to know the deeper meanings of these parables, that's not what's going on. It's actually a really sad commentary on the state of people's hearts and minds. And so Jesus is coming in the spirit of that prophet Isaiah and all of the Old Testament prophets, not just as God's messenger, but as the son of God come to preach, as he does here, come to heal, but also to die and raise to life again, thus conquering sin and death once and for all. Uh, Leon Morris is a commentator that has a, a commentary on the Gospel of Luke, and he points out that Jesus was growing in popularity at this time. Right, Large crowds are gathering around him. And Jesus was really concerned with their hearts because he didn't want people um, who were there just for kind of superficial reasons, who were there because it was exciting at the moment. He wasn't looking for superficial adherence or, or just kind of, uh, um, you know, sort of kind of be in the, in the vicinity of Jesus. He's looking for true followers, tr- people who truly get it and understand it and want to be shaped and changed by him and the words that he's speaking. And so he speaks in these parables because he, he wants to, he's, we, we got to remember, he's, he's building a core group of people that are going to be left in charge to spread the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's gathering these people with him, those people who have ears to hear. And so for many of these people who are listening, they don't have ears to hear. And to them, it just sounds like a familiar story. But to those who are willing to listen and lean in, there's a deeper meaning here. Because parables are meant to draw the listeners, not just to the truth, but to the teller. Jesus 
wanted people to come to him like his disciples did. I mean, notice his disciples didn't understand it either. But they knew that the answer could be found in Jesus Christ. I think that's really important for us to see and to understand. Not that we're to try to figure everything out, but that we're to lean into the one who has the answers, who has the life and the love for us in Jesus Christ. Jesus wants people to come like his disciples and say, tell me more. I don't understand this, but you have the words of life. Explain this to us. The disciples leaned into Jesus, and that's my hope for us, my invitation for us as we sort of unravel and understand this parable is that we would lean into Jesus. Even, in our, even if we don't understand, even if we find our hearts resistant right now, to what God has for us. Maybe some of us here and we think we've got it all figured out. There's a reality that there are, there's a, there are, there are, there are things that, that God wants to reveal to us that we don't yet understand. But he invites us to come and to be with him. So here's the meaning of the parable. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. 11 to 15. Now, the parable is this. This is great, because Jesus is like, here it is, right? In many ways, I could just read this and then just close the book and be done, and we would all go home. But Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So Jesus is very explicit for us here. And many, um, most parables have kind of like this one meaning and we're, we, we sometimes get too bogged down by trying to like decipher every little nuance of the parable. But here Jesus sort of does this for us and there are things there, some deeper things for us to understand. The first is that the seed is the word of God. That's sort of a broad term, isn't it? The word of God. We talk about the Bible as the word of God. Uh, In the Old Testament, uh, you have this phrase, the word of God came to Isaiah or some prophet as this revelation of God, as the word of God. Jesus is called the word of God. Uh. Certainly, the gospel, the good news, is the word of God. So what word is being, what word does the seed represent? Well, I think all of that. It's the revealed truth of God. It's how God has shown himself to us, revealed himself to us, whether that's through scripture, prophetic word that came to an Old Testament prophet, certainly and most obviously through Jesus Christ. And then when we talk about the gospel, the gospel is sort of the summary word that means good news, that is kind of a summary of everything that we have here. That we are sinful people, that we are rebellious, we have have chosen to turn our backs on God, our creator who made us to know him and, and share an intimacy and relationship with him. But we've decided that, no, you know what? I want to live my life my way. I want to find purpose and satisfaction and love, significance, admiration, all of these things my way. And we've turned our back on God. And yet God in his love, his mercy, his kindness, his grace towards us sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross, who took on the penalty for our sin. In the greatest demonstration of love towards us, Christ died And then in the greatest demonstration of power rose again, conquering sin and death. This is the seed, this is the word that's being spread. We're made for God, God wants to know us, and the way to know him is through Jesus Christ. Now, what we do with that seed is a different story. 
And so already we're kind of forced to consider, what is the, what is the soil of my heart look like? What is this for me? And in many ways, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's saying, look, there's going to be different responses to the gospel, to the seed that's being spread, the word. But we can also uh, reflect on our own lives and our own hearts. The purpose of scattering the seed is so that it will grow and bear fruit. Like that's the basic, right? That's why a farmer does it. He's not out there just for fun. The hope is that it would grow up healthy and bear fruit. The stuff on the path, the stuff in the, in the shallow soil over the rock, the stuff in the weeds, it's useless to him. The purpose is for growth and fruit bearing. And the same is true with the word of God, the implanted word, the gospel of Jesus Christ in our hearts. The purpose is growth and fruit. So the seed of the gospel is broadcast to everyone, but not everyone receives it. And there's three outcomes from broadcasting the word of God. There's three distinct outcomes. The first one is no growth at all. It doesn't even get anywhere. This is the seed that is thrown along the path. So just as a seed cannot take root in a sidewalk, the gospel seed, the word of God, cannot take root in a hard heart. A heart that is resistant, that, that hears that like so many do about Jesus and say, that's foolishness. I don't buy it for a second. That seed of the word, that life-giving seed, will not take root in that kind of a heart. And then what happens when that seed is laying there? Well, the birds come along, right? You've experienced this. If you've reseeded your lawn, you've spread that seed. You've, you've spent a half a day, if not longer. You've spent so much money on this seed and then the topsoil, which always costs more than you think it's supposed to. And then you get it out there and you cover it up and you're watering it and you're watching and you're waiting for your little rye grass to come up. And then what happens? The little sky demons called birds come down. <laughs> And they start eating your precious seed. And it's so frustrating. You just want to get out there with them. <laughs> this is the reality of life, right? And the deeper meaning here that Jesus is telling us is that, hey, that seed that's fallen on the path that's not going to germinate, guess what? These birds, they come along and gobble it up. And Jesus says, that's, that's representative of the devil, that there is an adversary, a spiritual adversary who hates God, who hates us, who despises our humanity, despises the gospel of Jesus Christ, and quickly gobbles that seed up. And how can he gobble that seed up? Because a hardened heart has allowed it to just ricochet off and it's laying there and he takes it away. And that person with a hard heart, that's where it starts. We can't blame it on the devil. The devil made me do it isn't a thing. Sin is in our hearts. Our hearts are hard. And yet the enemy swoops in on that opportunity and steals it away so that there's no chance at that moment now praise be to god that god can and will transform heart of stone to a heart of flesh to receive that word of god so my prayer my hope for you is if you're listening and and maybe you have that hard heart and you've rejected this idea that there's still there's still time there's still time to consider the state of your own heart The second response or the, the outcome from broadcasting the word of God is that there's some growth but no fruit. And this is represented by the next two soils. So there's the soil of the rock. It's over the rock. 
And this is really describing a, a real common emotional experience. So people hear about Jesus Christ. Maybe you're in a context where it just everyone's doing it and saying it, and it just feels so good, and it seems like God's just going to make your life a whole lot better. And so you put your trust in Jesus. And yet Jesus is saying that's actually really shallow soil. Here's what I'm not doing. I'm not condemning emotion. God's given us emotion. We should have emotion as we experience the presence of God in things like worship, things like the community of people like Rachel was sharing up here, gathering around us in times of need. God's given us this emotion. But what I do know is that emotions can deceive us. Emotions are fleeting. We need to understand that when Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, he wants us to understand. Certainly there is an allowance for an emotional engagement with God. There should be. I'd be concerned if we were just singing like robots. But there's this, there's, there's this person, and maybe you can relate to this, who receives the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ with great joy, but there's no root. There's no root. NFL season is upon us, and I have, a, I have a confession to make to all you sports fans out there. I've been a Cardinals fan, but I really just don't care right now. <laughs> we, have, we have adversity has struck, and I'm just like, I'm over it. I'm just, I'm so done. My wife would call me a fickle fan, and that is what I am right now. It, it hurts to say it, but I'm just so done right now. Yeah, yeah. It's bad. <laughs> Please pray for me. It's bad enough when we do it with relatively inconsequential things like sports. But the reality is that we have this heart and attitude at times with Jesus Christ. Where we think that Jesus is looking for fans. He's not. He's looking for followers. It's okay to be excited about Jesus. It's okay to get other people excited and to, to worship him and to praise him. But the reality is that many times our life doesn't get better in the sense that we might want it to when we follow Jesus, it can get harder. We start to see and understand things that we didn't see or understand before, and we realize that we pretty soon we realize that, oh, Jesus wants all of me, not just the rah-rah part of me. And so this seed, it lands on the shallow soil, but it can't take root because it's too shallow. There's a shallow faith there. Adversity comes, life gets hard, and because there was no real engagement with what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the excitement wears off. And the extent of their devotion to Jesus becomes the extent of my devotion to the cardinals. They are fans at best, and Jesus is not looking for fans. He's looking for followers. Discipleship, Jesus, following Jesus is hard. Jesus tells his followers to count the cost. Then there's the seed that falls among the thorns. The soil's good, but then there's all these other weeds and thorns and things that begin to take over. Life happens, and since there was no real consideration about the fact that following Jesus is drastically life-changing, they fall away. This is a common story. Jesus grows less and less convenient the more life goes on. There's cares, there's pursuits, there's pleasures, and these things fight for our attention. There's a lot of opportunity. We live in a land of opportunity, and that's wonderful, but it's also deadly. Uh, I watched the Global Leadership Summit a few weeks ago, and one of the speakers there 
was talking about a Chinese man that he knew, a Chinese Christian man who lived in China, who ran a a home church out of his house. And the government came in and raided it and everything, and he was taken into into prison. Um, I don't know what they did to him there, but he was being persecuted for his faith. He did not waver in his faith under the pressure of torture or the threat of torture, of persecution, uncertainty about what would happen to him or his family or his friends, his church. Well, through a series of circumstances, he was released and actually was able to come to the United States. This devout Chinese Christian man came to the United States and was able to make a life for himself. He took advantage of the opportunities that we have in our country. He built up a business. And, and this man who was so involved with his church regularly every week, more, more than one time a week, started to come every month. Not that attendance is everything, but look, there's, there's reality and there's power in the proximity of being with God's people. Pretty soon, he ended up just completely drifting away and essentially stopped following Jesus. That's insane, isn't it? This man who would not buckle under the pressure of persecution buckled under the pressure of prosperity. It's powerful. And we face it every day. I think the weeds and the thorns for us right now in this little slice of our place and time is really real. The third outcome of this broadcasting of the word is growth and fruit. And this is the good soil. There's encouragement even in the fact that hey, this is a big field. So a lot of it is good soil. That's my hope and my prayer is that we get to be a part of that gospel community of good soil that's producing, growing and producing fruit. These are faithful followers. The gospel has taken root in their hearts. They're growing and they hold it fast. I love this phrase. They hold it fast with an honest and a good heart. What's an honest heart? The first thing I think about is that there's, the, there's an honesty in being willing to let the seed of the gospel transform our hearts. There's an honesty in saying, I can't do this on my own. I need Jesus in my life. There's an honesty in going, hey, I know that there's some days are going to be really hard as a follower of Jesus Christ, but I believe that he's the son of God and that he died and rose again, that he's coming again, and I want to be living in his kingdom here and now. And there's a goodness with that. They're allowing the truth of gospel to permeate their lives. And over time, they are transformed. They're bearing fruit with patience, it says. And I think that's important for us to remember. I think one of the things that Jesus wants us to hear in this parable is that this all takes time. Over time, the people who who really allow the word of God to, to, to take root in their hearts will bear fruit. And I think this leads us to the point here. The gospel is for everyone, but not everyone receives it. Some will reject it immediately. Some will accept it, but then abandon it, while others accept it and grow. Only time will tell. Something that occurred to me about the soil that allows the the plant to grow and then produce fruit, is that any plant that produces fruit, what's the fruit? It's the seed. Yeah, it's the seed. You can tell very quickly, there's other ways to tell, but you can tell very quickly what kind of plant it is by the fruit, by the seed that it produces. And so I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an encouragement for us. There's a call in here to recognize that that fruit that's being produced is meant to then multiply. So God has has invited us on mission with him to multiply. Again, it goes all the way back to Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply to make more disciples of Jesus Christ. So Lord willing, as as the seed of the word of God takes root in our hearts, individually and collectively as a church, we're growing as disciples of Jesus. 
and beginning to produce fruit, fruit that resembles Jesus and his kingdom, where people would look at us and go, ah, they're, they're different. There's something unique about them that I want to be a part of. Hence that prayer that, that God would bring us people who are hungry and thirsty for Jesus, and when they come, that they might find Jesus among us, because we too are hungry and thirsty for him. We're demonstrating the fruit so that more seed gets planted in people's hearts. So what are we to do with this? There's a lot of things, but here's where I landed for us today. Examine the soil of your own heart. I don't want us to be looking around and going, oh, if I had to guess, this, this person is that soil. That's not what we're to do with this. Only time will tell, right? But as for us, like what, where am I with this? So here's some, some questions that sort of reflect the different soils that I hope just get you thinking so that you wouldn't just shut it out, so that you would truly have ears to hear. And I include myself in this. These are questions I've got to ask myself. Do I find myself resistant to Jesus? And have you asked yourself why? At least spend some time on answering why. What biases do you bring to this conversation, to this message, to this parable? We all have them. Is your faith tethered to an isolated event or person? Where you think about the good old days of what it was like to rah-rah for Jesus, but you're feeling kind of dry and you're feeling, it almost feels like God's distant somehow. Let me tell you, that's a normal Christian experience. But are you tethered to that? That's shallow soil. You're tethered to that experience, that, that, that moment in past somehow, uh, an emotional time. Maybe you're going through something hard right now and you feel yourself drifting. That's not because Jesus isn't working. It's because your understanding and expectations are shallow. How much do you care about success, comfort, and pleasure in this life? How much of that drives you? Here's what we tend to do. We, we tend to add Jesus onto an accessory of that. Hey, Jesus, come follow me as I follow this and bless me along the way. That's not what Jesus is calling us to. You don't have ears to hear if that's you. Jesus is fully transforming us. He's changing our desires. He's, he's changing our perspective, our understanding, our expectations. And let me tell you, they're much bigger and better than what this life, this world has to offer us. If we would only trust him and follow. What has Jesus promised you and how does what he promises compare with what you are pursuing? Do you even know what he promises you? It's time to do a little digging into the soil of our, our hearts. And lastly, what does bearing fruit look like in your life? If that's the whole point of it, growth and fruit bearing, what does that look like for us? Individually and collectively. So, Father, we come to you wanting ears to hear. Lord, we thank you that you spread the word of your gospel, that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we confess to you that there are so many things that are threatening that seed really taking root and causing growth and fruitfulness in our lives. There are so many things around us that just want to stop us dead in our tracks, and we need you. We need endurance from you. We need patience. We need honesty and goodness of heart. So God, would you convict us where that's needed, that we would confess sin to you and turn and repent 
and receive your forgiveness and your grace and your love towards us. Give us courage and endurance to persist, Lord, in our faith. Whatever comes our way, whether that's persecution or prosperity, whether that's just a spiritual dryness or spiritual sense of life, God, in all of these seasons, would you just draw us into you, Lord, and give us a deeper understanding, not just so that we would know about you, but that we might know you live in your kingdom and be fruitful. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Communion is a time to remember. It is a time to examine our hearts. I want to give you some space, some permission even to, to just be where you are for a little bit while the ushers are standing up here. If you want to pray before coming forward, that's a good practice. Let's not come to the front because this is the time in the service where we do that. Let's, re let's remember that we are remembering our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave this special meal, so to speak, to us to remember his death, his sacrifice, that in him we are saved. I know there's some kids in here. Parents, uh, if your kids... If you know your kids don't really quite fully understand what's happening right now, um, that's okay. You can bring them up, but don't give them some bread, bread or the cup and go back to your seat with them. And maybe you want to take some time to pray with them. Uh, I encourage you at a different time to engage with your kids in this matter. Um, but for those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, I invite you forward. Ushers, you can come forward at this time. Let's take some time reflecting. Let's take some time remembering that when Jesus took the bread, he broke it saying, this is my body given for you. And he took the cup saying, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let us eat, drink, and remember.